Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Just to, I'll do a quick run through uh, what's been happening with the breastfeeding strategy, but also what I wanted to show you was some lovely slides from the most recent Breastfeeding Health Intelligence Briefing. Now, these slides, I have to say, are developed by my colleague Julie Neal in Health Intelligence, who works so hard to get that report done on an almost annual basis. She chairs the um, Monitoring and Indicators work strand of the Strategy Group. So these lovely slides with the data on it, they're not, my, they're not mine really, they're Julie's and they belong to the Public Health Agency. I don't want you to think I spent all this time pulling this together. But um, there's good news, there's really good news. We are moving in the right direction. So just to say, this is our 10-year breastfeeding strategy, breastfeeding a great start 2013 to 2023. And um, just in the last year, the Department of Health has asked us to review the strategy, to look to see how, where we are and where we need to go next. So I'm delighted to say that we now have a live working document um, and recently the breastfeeding strategy has undergone a significant refreshing and so we have been looking at where the gaps are and making sure that in our live breastfeeding strategy implementation action plan um, that we have included what needs to happen, what we, how we need, where we need to go, which of course includes some lovely research which we really want to happen. These are the 10 work strands of the Breastfeeding Strategy Implementation Steering Group. They are chaired by representatives from education, from the Department of Health. I chair too many of them, three of them, and half chair another one. But um, our lead um, within uh, the Public Health Agency for, for CMASH, um, Heather Reid, also chairs a group. Um, and of course, our colleagues in communication, which is where our lovely hashtag Not Sorry Mums campaign came from this year. I'd also like to say in terms of, of leadership within, which is one of the key areas that we really want to try and, and ensure that we have the cover in Northern Ireland. Um, recently, Liz Hood, who is the infant feeding lead for Belfast Health and Social Care Trust within Health Visiting, has taken over as chair of NIFIN, the National Infant Feeding Network for Northern Ireland, which links to the UK wider group, which is a really important group, which is there not just to promote best practice, but to protect breastfeeding, which is something we're increasingly having to do. There are influences out there. I don't want to, you know, labour it too much, but some of you may know, and um, maybe with a bit of with a bit of hesitation, not asking you to rush and look at it, but the formula industry in the last week have produced a new code. Have any of you heard of that? The infant nutrition code. And they're just saying they're marvellous and they are, oh, they're very accountable, you know, and they've got this new body. So um, that, that politically has gone out, that has gone out to each of our health departments of health and on paper it looks marvellous. So we just need to be mindful that we need to strengthen our networks and have our voices that will protect breastfeeding. Otherwise, whenever Brexit actually happens, formula industry may have a very powerful foothold in the UK because we won't have to seek, we won't have to abide by the EU regula regulations and you can be sure they'll be in there trying to weaken what we already have never mind pushing for implementation of the full WHO code so sorry to be so negative on that but I thought I have to say this because I have to flag it up with you if you google INC co or sorry infant nutrition code it's from the uh, what are they called the British Nutrition Specialist Forum, which is made up of industry. So they're very naughty, very, very naughty. So just watch out for that one. Anyway, on a more positive note, in Northern Ireland, we have a team of breastfeeding specialists who work within trusts. And, and as Jonah was saying, sometimes access may be a concern, but we do want to continue to get that message out there. They work incredibly hard. They're not only leading on BFI, but they're also supporting women who are having breastfeeding challenges. So each trust has been asked to develop a breastfeeding specialist pathway, and we are asking them also to audit implementation of that, trying to get the support to the women that need it. But I know there are gaps, but we need to continue to work on that and continue to raise awareness about the support that's available via the health service. We have lovely, we have five new lovely neonatal infant feeding leads in the last year or two, and that's, that's been an amazing development for us here. Now, this is just some of the stuff that we've been up to in the last year. I have, um, I have the lovely job of uh, 
holding the purse strings, I suppose you could say, for breastfeeding. And, and that's a bit of a double-edged sword and a bit of a worry because you kind of think, oh my goodness, I wish I could get more and I wish I could spread it further. But I'm actually pretty good at taking other people's money. If anybody offers me it, I'll take it. Thank you very much. And obesity is great. We get a lot of help from obesity, so we're not complaining. Okay, so the public information ca campaign that ran uh, in February and March, the evaluation is really good for that. Diana and I have to go to this awards event in Titanic Hotel this evening because it's been nominated for an award. Yeah, a media award. Well, uh -huh. But yeah, so if anybody's been to these events, you wouldn't be clapping at the prospect of going to it. It goes on till one o'clock in the morning. And of course, you're always driving home. But anyway, it's the CIM Awards. And I think that's really big in marketing. So um, yeah, that's brilliant. Anyway, um, in terms of Baby Friendly Initiative, we've had the wonderful um, progress in Northern Trust with the Gold Awards and the maintenance of the other reaccreditations across maternity services, which is great. Training, we've continued to commission training, not just me, but of course the work that Fiona and her team and HSCCEC do and all the in-service training it continues to happen. We have, of course, our parent information with the Welcome Here scheme. And since the campaign was launched on the 31st of January, at that time, we had about 500 members of the Breastfeeding Welcome Here scheme. The total is now over 700. So that alone, to start and create more supportive environments for women. I do know that, there, that sometimes we worry that women will think, well, I'm only welcome to feed in, an, in, a, in a place that has a pink and white sticker. It's not about that. It's about getting the message across and wider to councils and businesses that we want to create supportive environments for women. So I hope in some way that has been, I mean, it just shows that the campaign really helped because that was a call to action. And certainly two major councils have recently joined the scheme, which is another really welcome development. Research and the work that Nikki does through the research work strand is so important. And it is one of the hardest, I have to say, work strands that she has in that there is so much of a buzz. There is so many really enthusiastic people who are working so hard for us to get the answers as to how we move forward for breastfeeding in Northern Ireland. So thank you very much, Nikki, for all that work and Marlene and the rest of the team that you put in. Neonatal support is key. We really need to move in terms of encouraging more mums going home from the neonatal unit breastfeeding. The last figures we had to compare ourselves to the rest of the UK were really worrying. So that's why the neonatal posts are in place. That's why we were encouraging them to develop more um, integrated family, integrated care, Do you know, involving parents in that and helping them to understand the importance of a close and loving relationship and valuing breastfeeding. So that work continues. The Human Milk Bank, bless them, have not had a good year. And thank goodness it's up and running again. So I'm absolutely delighted that is the case. Thank goodness. Yeah. And um, the PHA has supported the Milk Bank heavily and we continue to support the Milk Bank. Um, they're hoping to um, procure a electronic tracking system, which will mean that whenever milk is given, the label on the bottle is linked to the baby's name band, and then you know exactly which baby that milk went to, and you can track outcomes as well. And then, you, you know, so that'll be amazing. And we have um, Dr. Ray Nethercott, who is working with us on that in procuring that system. We're very, we're very keen to get that up and running as soon as possible. Workplace support continues. I've been doing a bit of work within the public sector and within government and within health and social care to encourage them through the joint negotiating forum, I think it's called, for all of health and social care family to make sure they are supportive of breastfeeding mums who are returning to work. If we can't do it, where well, how on earth can we expect private organisations to do it well? And then, of course, there's peer support, and we need to continue to grow peer support. I am passionate about peer support, and I know sometimes the evidence doesn't always say, you know, this is this is re this really works. But I just think that there's peer to support that happens that isn't measurable. Do you know? Whenever in families women succeed, 
they become the peer supporters. They become the people in their community who encourage. And it doesn't have to be somebody who's had 18 hours training or whatever it is we do, 16 hours training. It, it can be just somebody who's had. How we grow peer support is by women having positive experiences and being able to give that encouraging word. And so, and I mean, also the work, of course, that Adele does is invaluable in maintaining breastfeeding in Northern Ireland because that's peer support in action. Thank you, so Nicola. That's, that's the support you do. Thank you very much. Because we have these debates, you know, we have these yeah, discussions yeah, at the research work strand. So I thought I had to bring that in, but in case you told me off afterwards. <laughs> So now to the, the figures, okay, so these, this is um, breastfeeding having been attempted. This is breastfeeding um, while in hospital in the, in the time between delivery and, and then um, discharge, okay. So what we can see here that in 2012, across all of Northern Ireland, it was 54.1%. But in 2017 now, we're saying it's nearly 60%. Yay! So it looks like we're up 6% initiation, more or less. So that's great. That's all good news. Sorry, I'm moving this about. I'm so excited. <laughs> And, um, and then one of the things that Julie has been doing, working with the infant feeding leads, is adding on some new, as she calls it, experimental data, new fields on NIMATS. And so now we're actually measuring skin-to-skin -skin contact. And you can see from this slide that um, any skin-to-skin -skin contact across all was 83%, which I think is pretty darn good. Now, we do want it to be skin to skin for at least an hour or until after the first feed. But even then, for women who are breastfeeding, at 75%. Now, this is all births. I think that shows a huge shift in midwifery practice and a huge recognition of how important this is. I see it whenever I'm doing assessments, it's very, very traceable that if a mother doesn't have skin to skin contact and her baby isn't fed before she leaves the labor ward, that baby is much less likely to be a, become a reluctant feeder, to have her the blood glucose checked, you know, to end up having a formula supplement. Skin to skin contact is key to us maintaining our breastfeeding rates and particularly exclusive breastfeeding. So really well done to all those midwives and all those mummies that are enjoying all that lovely skin to skin contact. Oh, forgot to say, these slides are part of the Breastfeeding Health Intelligence Briefing Report and that report isn't published online yet, but it will be, it will be, okay? So it has gone out to the Breastfeeding Strategy Group and it has gone out to the midwifery leads throughout Northern Ireland and the infant feeding leads. So it's just to let you know that you will be able to down, you know, you'll be able to have a really good look at these slides in more detail. Now we come to another exciting slide, well at least I think it's exciting. And I know it's small, but in 2006, you can see there that our breastfeeding rates at discharge was 40.4%. And then there was a bit of a blip. You can see there in 2012, I don't know what happened, but we're on the up again, thank goodness. So in 2016, and then these are slightly provisional figures, I think we're nearly there with it, but um, we're saying it's 46.2%. Julie is really particular about how this data is uh, quality assured and cleaned, so she always puts provisional in it. But I think we can be fairly confident this is the highest we've ever been at. So it does, for me, represent a real shift, a small but a shift in increasing our breastfeeding rates. I find this slide really, really interesting because it shows how midwifery led standalone units um, have much higher breastfeeding rates. And I know it's because those are women that are lower risk. But can you see here that down Patrick Hospital, so uh, it's maybe not that easy to see. The pale blue is total breastfeeding, okay? And then the red is partial breastfeeding, so some formula, and then that's the bottle feeding. So Down Patrick Midwifery Led Unit leads the table, but in terms of our consultant led units, you can see there that the Ulster seems to be the highest at 52% on discharge, so that's 43.8 and then 9, and then closely followed um, by Craig Avon. 
doesn't it? Not right? Yeah, have I got that right? Yeah. But Craig Allen's late supplementation rate is a wee bit higher, or mixed feeding rate. It's really tricky because some of those women are going home because they want to be mixed feeding, do you know? And so there, there's, a, there's a whole story behind all of that. But certainly the thing though that is stark for me is how much green there is in that. How many babies never even got one breast feed? You know, that's, that's where we need to be working on. So <laughs> we're talking there about um, Adele was saying about all these wonderful mummies that are tandem feeding and feeding right into the baby's early years, which is marvellous, the child's early, early years. Um, if we look at our data up to 12 months, as we've seen before, there is a significant drop off. But where we are say, seeing increases is at 6 months and 12 months. So you can see in 2013, it's as I say, it's really hard to see on the Navy bar, but in 2013 at six months, 10.3% um, of all babies in Northern Ireland were breastfed. And in 2015, that's up to 14.1. So potentially in a couple of years, our six months figures, this is all, all the babies, uh, well, all that are recorded. Um, and then at 12 months, it was uh, for 2013, 5.2, 6.5, and now 8.1. So the other thing that we need to be working on is, is the recording. And can you see there, there is some under, there will be a lag in terms of the babies that have to reach a full year of age that were born at the end of 2015. So you can't look at the data to the end of 2016. Then you have to quality assure it. So it seems to take ages before you have access to it. But I am kind of taking heart because the under recordings, which is the unknown in the pale blue, is getting less. We are moving in the right direction. My colleagues in public health nursing in the PHA would have responsibility for child health system and the red book and, and just making sure that that continues to be flagged up and the like of Liz there is doing sterling work with just reminding all the health visitors, please, please, please make sure that you record whether it's not at all or whether it is. So <clears throat> this is a map of Northern Ireland, as you know, and um, this shows us our breastfeeding rates by area, by electoral ward. And the darkest ones are the highest breastfeeding rates and the pale ones are the lowest. And you can see there like the huge variation that we have. But if I was to tell you where the lowest breastfeeding rates are, sorry, Shauna, White Rock 13.7, Ardoyne 14.6 and Shankill 14.9, they're the lowest three. And the highest, no surprises here, and this always astounds me every time I hear it, Stormont 85.9 on discharge, uh -huh. Craig of Ad 82.8, and then the rest of them, of the high, there's a whole load like Hollywood, Priory, Drumbo are all in the 80s. So that, um, I mean, one of the things I would say is that, is that what we need to keep shouting about is breastfeeding has huge potential to reduce inequalities. You know, the study that was done, the Howie study in Stuart Forsyth, I heard him years ago, said, talked about babies in Glasgow and those living among the most deprived areas who were breastfed were healthier than children in social class five who were living in the affluent areas. This is what we need to be shouting about. This is how we can give these children a better start. And that's just breaking it down a bit um, a bit closer, as you can see there. And this is the Sheer Start figures, the first time we've had the Sheer Start figures. But what I would say, and Shona would be the expert on this, that in some of the ones with the really high rates, I suspect it's about women coming in from, that they're in that Sheer Start catchment, but they're from the higher income groups. Do you know, they're the, maybe the more affluent women potentially. But there is some really significant differences there. So South Belfast 54.4, Clocker Valley 55.7, and then you have Dungannon, and last they're the ones that are bumping along there at really high, and then we we'll have the lower ones. But that's really good data to have. There's also women from other countries, from Yes. Culture, so, so some of those sure starts with the time that was less minority families who are more likely to Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah, so it's complex, isn't it? Demographics is huge. It's about the age of the mother and make, you know, you can't always compare like with like. Um, and also, as you say, migrant women, where there are high numbers of migrant women are higher. I think we've only 10% overall migrant women in Northern Ireland. And, and compared to the Republic of Ireland, it would be 20%. So that's, yeah. This slide here is really interesting. I'm sorry, it might be quite hard for you to see, but Julie has done a significant piece of work in finding out what's happening throughout the UK with infant feeding data. And um, she has looked at um, what England's doing, what Wales is doing, and what Scotland is doing. And actually, we're the only country, bar what's happening in the Republic of Ireland at three months, who are um, collecting breastfeeding data beyond 68 weeks. And we will continue to do that, and we will continue um, you know, to quality assure that and flag up the importance of that. So we need this because we lost the UK Infant Feeding Survey, sadly, in 2010, and it was invaluable. And I know it was only a survey, but sometimes it's really difficult then just to make a comparison with the rest of the UK. And we maybe are a bit hard on ourselves. We beat ourselves up thinking, you know, oh, it's terrible, we're always the lowest. But really, <clears throat> there are some areas very deprived areas in England and Wales that are very, very similar to our deprived areas, you know. So there, it's about looking at the bigger picture. So I'm just going to leave the figures for a while and I try not moving about. Sorry, this is going everywhere. I just realised I dance about all the time. I'm having to hold on here to stop myself moving. So um, we had our lovely breastfeeding campaign. It's been evaluated. It has showed, I'm not going to talk too much about the evaluation of it, but it has showed a shift, a positive shift in attitudes. That was the only campaign that the Public Health Agency was able to run in 1718. And it was the Permanent Secretary who said, OK, you can go ahead and do it, because we had it all set up and ready to go. So um, it, still, it still has a presence, I think, in social media. It reached so far and wide, and we really were really pleased with it. And we hope to continue to maybe look to see, could we rerun it again if we ever get a government, well, you know, probably we'll have to just get on and do it without them. But <laughs> if, we, if, if we ever get permission to do it again, and hopefully we will. But you know, it was good fun because we had this silly smiley frame thing, whatever you call those. What do you call those? Those frames, selfie frames, aren't they? Se selfie frames or something. But that lady there is Valerie Watts. She's the chief executive of the Public Health Agency and the Health and Social Care Board. And that lovely lady is the Lady Mayoress. I don't think she is anymore, is she? No, Nila. And then just to say that as part of the campaign, the engagement through breastfeeding in Northern Ireland, which is again an invaluable resource to PHA as well for connecting with women. Do you know, if we need a mummy, you can get out there, you can, we can go to the infant feeding leads, but also we can go and find, is there anybody who would be interested in doing A, B and C? I did, I think I said this the last time or somewhere else, I did tell our PR guys off, because I said, he just picked the most beautiful breastfeeding mummies or what? because they really are stunning. <clears throat> and then as part of um, the campaign, we had a wee bit of a revisit now, not as much as I would have liked, but we've gone to breastfed babies and tried to tighten it up and modernize it a bit. It's far too wordy. It needs to be more visual. There's more work needing done on it. But what we have added is this interactive map. And if I was online, you would flicker over those numbers, click on it, and it takes you to all the breastfeeding welcome here facilities and to the breastfeeding support groups in that area. We have nearly 70 support groups. And can I just say, I hope that our breastfeeding groups aren't being cut here. There are pressures in the midwifery services and in having a midwife at each group because there's shortage, severe shortages of midwives in the west and southern area. But if any of you hear that a breastfeeding group has stopped or is under threat, you need to let me know. Okay, and we'll see what we can do because we can't afford to do that. The women need the help, they need it, and we must not let that happen.